If you're not eligible for robotic surgery, your head and neck doctor may recommend proton therapy, more commonly known as radiation, plus chemotherapy. This combination treatment protocol is by far more grueling than surgery, with long-term effects such as significant weight loss, damaged salivary glands, loss of taste, and overall fatigue and weakness. The good news, radiation technology has evolved. Intensely modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT, works to try to reduce damage to healthy areas in the body. Intensely modulated means that the radiation comes in from different angles to, um, to focus the radiation in certain areas and spare other areas. So traditionally radiation would just come in from one side, out the other side. And it would, it was like a tidal wave, it would just blast through everything. With IMRT, uh, they can bring it in from different angles to really spare important structures. The protons is kind of added on to this, this uh, multi-directional uh, approach. And the proton is a different particle than um, photons that are used uh, for traditional radiation. And the advantage that I explain to patients with proton is that it avoids the exit wound, so to speak. So whereas traditional x-ray beams go through and through and cause damage the whole way through, uh, proton particles are designed to go in at a lower dose, essentially, and then, uh, in, in a sense, explode at the prescribed depth without an exit wound. So, the, so it allows for a high dose of radiation where you want it, and even more so minimizing the amount of radiation to areas you don't. Some institutions, it's, it's given prophylactically. There's sort of a belief, and this is maybe, a, I guess, a traditional approach with this disease that so many patients wind up with a feeding tube that why not just start with it? Because it is harder to get one during the middle of treatment. Um, it's more uncomfortable, it can delay treatment. Uh, so prophylactic feeding tube has some advantages that way. Um, particularly since um, still in most places the majority of patients wind up with one. So it's anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of patients uh, by the end of treatment will have a feeding tube. Now at our institution we take a, a different approach um, and I think this is being adopted more commonly now which is more of a reflexive uh, placement of feeding tubes so only when patients need it. Uh, and the rationale behind that is that patients who get a feeding tube uh, during treatment are more likely to have swallowing problems down the road. So the patients who can get through treatment without a feeding tube um, seem to do better. Their swallowing function is better. But ultimately, it's the treatments that dictate the toxicity that drives the use of feeding tubes. So again, whatever we can do to reduce that toxicity is going to reduce the the need for feeding tubes.